life is hard. And sometimes life is really, really hard. The diagnosis comes out of nowhere. The loss feels unbearable. The one that we so deeply love, their lives are caught up in some sort of cycle of addiction. The list could go on and on. Sometimes life feels so unfair. Sometimes life is so incredibly hard. But one of the greatest pieces of hope is that you and I serve a God who understands. Because it's a God who's walked the journey of his own challenge that our great God became man and he walked his own path of difficulty. He's a God who understands. You know, when you look throughout the pages of the Gospels, those first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're these eyewitness accounts that saw everything that Jesus did, all that Jesus said, they recorded it for us. What's fascinating about these four eyewitness accounts is they spend a disproportionate amount of time talking about the events of the last week of Jesus' life. It was a hard week. It was a really hard week. The the events ultimately culminated with the crucifixion of Jesus on Friday. And on one hand, when I look at the accounts throughout the Gospels, I'm, I'm moved like deeply by all that Jesus endured that week. And on another hand, I'm encouraged and inspired. Because what I find so amazing is Jesus knew what was going to happen on Friday. He had actually been talking about it with his closest friends for quite some time. He knew what was going to happen on Friday, and yet his posture, his example, is beautiful. And I wonder what it would look like if we leaned more into his journey, his example, his posture. That's our heart and intent tonight as we look at a few various events that took place that last week of Jesus' life. And that maybe you and I, as we lean into Jesus, his example, his posture, maybe you and I could draw out our own faith to face Friday.
what would I do? If Jesus rose from his place, wrapped a towel around his waist, and then placed a basin of water at my feet, can someone explain how it came to be that the King of Kings would be on his knees in front of me? I mean, he is perfection, absolutely, and here is this wreck of me. How can there ever be any middle here, any hope or prayer, any world where this makes sense? He is more glory than I can conceive, and I, I'm more broken than you would ever believe. So tell me who sees a way that I should receive one day his mercy, because my sin requires death. That is the payout of my life's gambling debts. My shame demands a sacrifice, and the blood of a lamb can't hope to suffice. Unless, of course, it were the lamb of God. But why would he? Arrayed in splendor, leave all that and choose to enter into the very epicenter of the offenders and render something so humble, so tender. Unless he was completely surrendered, surrendered to his father's plan, surrendered even to the ones who would demand his life. And so God came to us. He took on form and name like us. He humbled his human frame before us. And then he bore our sin and shame for us. For a good man, they say, there are some who might die, but the phrase good man, that doesn't even begin to apply, not here, not to you and I, and certainly not at the moment when he chose to die. Yet when sighing out his last breath, and when his heart stopped beating inside his chest, and when his voice cried out, it is finished. He did that for us.
it all started with surrender. It was the posture that Jesus embodied, not only this night, it, it was what he embodied his entire journey. It certainly characterized the rest of his journey. It was just a posture of surrender. And truly, it wasn't just the posture of Jesus, it's the posture of anybody who chooses to follow him. It all begins with sacrificial surrender. It's why we do what we do as followers of Jesus. We surrender our own lives to his. We surrender our own desires to follow his. It's why we choose to give, to love, to serve. Because it all starts with surrender. You know, any time we, we gather together as a church, part of the reason why we give in these moments is this is an opportunity to express our surrender. And we'll take an opportunity to, to give as we gather today. We're going to choose not to pass any kind of bags to give today, but instead, if you showed up prepared to give, you can do so on your way out today. And I would encourage you just do so simply from a heart and a posture of surrender. It's the pattern of Jesus, the pattern of our Savior, the pattern of our King, and the pattern of anybody who chooses to follow him. Because in surrender, we get the faith to face Friday. Just over my shoulder is the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives right here. 
In the ancient Hebrew world, um, olive oil was super valuable. It was one of the reasons that Rome wanted to occupy this area. Jesus came here after sharing the Last Supper with his disciples, after washing their feet. Jesus came here with three of his friends, Peter, James, and John. And he asked them to wait behind while, while he went a bit further ahead to pray among the olive trees. You know, I think it's interesting that this is where Jesus came to pray as he faced the coming moments, the suffering, the death, sitting among these olive trees because Jesus would not only have been familiar with how valuable olive oil is, he was also familiar with the process by which it was made. You know, through pressing, through pressure, valuable things can happen. This process for making olive oil, it's a multi-step process. The first part required the mashing up of olives using something called a millstone. It's just a gigantic stone, hundreds of pounds, and it would be used to crush the olives, to, to break the skin of the olives, and to eventually grind it into a paste. That paste would then be put into bags, either made of animal hair or fine thread, and then laid those bags on, on an olive press. The bags would act as sort of a filter in the process. And then they would take a stone, again, across the olive paste, and they would press out the olive oil. This was the first oil, the virgin olive oil. And in ancient Hebrew culture, it was this first pressed oil that would be used in the temple for sacred, holy ceremonies to anoint leaders, to anoint priests, to anoint kings. And after collecting the first pressed olive oil, more weight was added. And there would be a second pressing, and that oil would have, would have a, a yellow hue to it. And this would have been the oil people would use in their everyday lives for, for baking, for, for nourishment, for lighting of lamps, for, for healing. They would, they would rub it on their skin. This was the oil that was used every day in the life of every person. And after that second pressed oil, there was a third. More weight was added. This time, the oil would not be clear. It wouldn't be yellow, but it, that third press, it, it would produce a deep red oil. This oil came from the pits of the olives. And as that red liquid poured down the side of the basin, it would be collected in the bottom. And this oil contained a special lye. And the people would allow it to congeal. And they would eventually, they would use this oil to make soap for cleansing. So it's interesting to me that this is the place where Jesus came to pray, the Garden of Gethsemane. The name comes from two Hebrew words, get, which is the, the pressing, and shem, the, the oil, the place of pressing, where there is pressing and pressure, great value can come forth. Jesus had come to Jerusalem, the place of his pressing. He had come as the anointed king riding on a donkey. He had nourished and sustained his disciples in the Last Supper, sort of that second oil, the breaking of the bread together. And now Jesus is experiencing the third pressing, a moment that Scripture tells us was, was heavy, was so filled with stress and pressure that he began to sweat blood, a medical condition called hemotidrosis. It's extreme, but it makes sense. Look at what he was facing, Jesus, the that was facing the betrayal of one of his close friends, an arrest, mocking by some of the same people who had called him king just days before. Beatings, scourging. The father turned his face from him as he, as he hangs on a cross to carry and cleanse the sin of the world. He, he begged God as he prayed, Father, take this cup from me. But ultimately, ultimately he submitted to the plan of God, the perfect good God with a plan of salvation for all of us. I'm standing here among these olive trees considering the weight of the pressing of Jesus. Jesus, the anointed king. Jesus, the light of the world, the bread of life. Jesus, whose blood cleanses us from all sin.
Jesus was in Gethsemane, that place of pressing. And he was experiencing such intense anguish in the face of his Friday. We read in Luke 22 that when Jesus arrived in Gethsemane, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Imagine for a moment the way that you have thought about Jesus approaching Good Friday. If you're like me, You've always imagined him moving towards the cross boldly, without fear. And yet, what we just heard Pastor Dave explain and what we read in this scripture leads me to believe that Jesus was experiencing such intense anguish over his impending Friday. Jesus had doubts. Jesus had questions. Jesus was wrestling with God in the face of his Friday. He was wrestling so much that he sweat blood and he would have recognized that those thick, warm drops of blood falling from his head were just a, a foreshadow of the blood he would shed just hours later. In the face of his Friday, Jesus questioned. Jesus wrestled. Each of us will face our own Fridays. Moments of despair, dark storms, times of pressing, when we feel like the weight of the world is so heavy upon us, we too are being pressed down. And it's only natural in those times that we call out to God, we cry out, we ask questions, we have doubts just like Jesus did. But we see that it's in the wrestling with God that we are actually able to discern God's strong, steady hand guiding us forward. Because 
We're gonna take communion together in just a moment. So if you don't have communion elements, you can raise your hand and someone from our team would love to serve you. Jesus was wrestling with God. And we hear Jesus call out to his father. He says, take this cup from me. But then we see this shift where he says, but not my will, but your will be done. What we see here is that even in the midst of his wrestling, even in the midst of his questions and his doubts about what is ahead, Jesus still chooses to submit himself to the will of the Father. And for Jesus, that means that he's moving towards his Friday. He's moving towards the pain. He's moving towards his death so that you and I we don't have to. And Jesus, he, he symbolizes this path before him as a cup. A cup that he knows because he's submitting himself to the will of the Father that he will have to drink from it. And Jesus, he knows what this cup means. Because hours earlier, he had sat at a table with his disciples. And he had raised a cup just like this, and he had said, I will pour out my life for you, for us. Jesus, he willingly submits himself to the will of the Father partakes of the cup that God has laid out before him so that we too might have a chance to submit ourselves to the will of the Father. Partaking of the cup and the bread, it's our opportunity, our reminder that we too can submit ourselves to the will of God and the path that he has laid out before us. And so we read about that first communion in Luke 22. He took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together now. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup together now. God, we pause on this Good Friday to remember your willingness to submit yourself to God on our behalf. We're humbled and we're grateful. And God, at this communion table, we again remind ourselves how grateful we are to have the opportunity to submit ourselves to you. We know that you are a good God. And we love you. And we're grateful for you.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. Through 
Eventually, the events of Friday culminated on a mountaintop. They called it Golgotha. It was the place of the skull. It was typically where crucifixions took place just outside of the city of Jerusalem. You got to understand that the, the Romans, they were, they were masters at this crucifixion. They had, they had practiced it over a number of years. They had figured out how to cause the most excruciating possible pain to the criminals that they were punishing on these days. For the Romans, it wasn't just about punishing a crime. It, it was about making a spectacle of the criminal. You see, nobody rivaled the authority and the power of Rome. Anybody who stood against them, they tried to make an example of them. And so on these crosses, on this hill, it was viewed from anywhere in the city. You could see the crucifixion take place. And oftentimes what they would do is they would take the charge of the, the criminal and they would take a board, they would print the charge on the board, and they would nail it to the top of the cross. It was a statement by Rome. It was basically saying, if you do these types of things, if you're guilty of these types of things, we're going to make an example out of you. This will be your fate too if you were to do it. Well, Jesus wasn't crucified alone that day. Uh, scripture tells us there was somebody crucified on his right and also on his left. There were three people who were crucified that day. What's fascinating is you think about the other two individuals. If you read what their criminal charge was, one translation says that they were thieves, and that's possible, and sometimes we'll talk about the thieves next to Jesus on the cross. But if you look at the original word that gets translated, possibly a better translation is that they were rebels meaning that they took part in some sort of rebellion, which would make a little bit more sense why Roman wouldn't make an example out of them, because anybody who tested the authority of Rome, anybody who, who pushed the authority of Rome, anybody who wanted to, to lead an uprising or some type of rebellion, they were certainly to put, be put to death in a spectacle kind of way, saying, if you choose to push us, this will be your fate too. And so likely Jesus was actually crucified between two people who were part of rebellion. What makes matters more intriguing is just a few hours earlier, Pilate, the governor of Rome, he actually tried to release Jesus. In one of his ploys to try to release Jesus, he brought another criminal up in front of the crowd as, as a guy by the name of Barabbas. And he said, hey, who would you like me to release to you? I can release this guy named Barabbas or I can release to you Jesus the crowd chose Barabbas, sentencing Jesus to be crucified. What we know about Barabbas is he was one who did lead a rebellion. He was an insurrectionist. He was, he was charged with murder, which likely took place in the rebellion that he led. It is not too much of a stretch to think that these two criminals on the either side of Jesus might have participated in that exact same rebellion. And so if you look at the charge that would have been posted above their head, it would have said something like insurrection, rebellion, murder. 
And then you look to the charge of Jesus. It's what was written on the piece of wood that was fixed to the tree over his head. You have to imagine that the Jewish leaders, they were almost chomping at the bit, wondering what would Pilate write as the charge? Pilate himself. You got to think that maybe he was wanting to write something that somehow clears his own conscience because he certainly didn't want responsibility what was happening with Jesus. And so maybe only in a way the divine could have led in the moment. When Pilate got out a pen to write the charge, here is the charge. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Some charge, huh? I mean, this is the best that they could do to say that he was, he was king of the Jews. You, you got to think that in the moment that that any courtroom situation where you had somebody facing an impending jur- uh, verdict, the, the prosecution would bring every imaginable uh, charge against them. They, they would try to bring the, the, the worst out in that moment. And yet, this was the best they could come up with. That Jesus of Nazareth was actually king of the Jews. It kind of causes us to pause and reflect on the notion that he had no sin. That there was really no charge that could be posted against him. Reminds us of words that were written about him later in the Bible that he who had no sin became sin for us so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. When you look at this charge, what do you see? I have to wonder on the very day that this was posted above Jesus' head, if, if this was looked at from a few different angles. When the, when the religious leaders, the, the Jewish religious leaders, when they looked at this charge, they, they had to have looked at it with a cynical heart. They actually tried to get Pilate to change the charge and, and write a little, a uh, few extra words in the charge to say he was one who claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate chose not to change it. But it doesn't change the fact that the religious leaders didn't believe it. Uh, they had a cynical heart. They, they didn't believe this was true. They had so much antagonism, so much opposition to the person of Jesus. So one heart that existed that day was a cynical heart, but I also wonder if there was an apathetic heart. I mean, Pilate himself had asked Jesus a few hours earlier, are you some kind of king? Which in the Roman world would have been a big deal if Jesus claims to be king, rivaling the authority of Caesar. That would have been a significant thing. And Jesus responds, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate didn't see Jesus as a threat. He didn't really understand the whole thing. And I wonder if when Pilate wrote these words, it was almost in a mockery type of heart and spirit. It was apathetic. He was indifferent. Jesus didn't make any kind of difference in his life. Jesus wasn't relevant to him in any way. On that day on Calvary, when people looked at that charge, there were some who had a cynical heart, there were some who had an apathetic heart, and there were some who were there that believed this to actually be true. That maybe, just maybe, he is a king. And their hearts would be transformed, not only in that moment, their hearts would be transformed for all of eternity. How about you? When you look at these words, what does your heart see? Still today, there are many who look at Jesus, the things of God through Jesus, they look through a very cynical heart, antagonistic heart, very opposed to the things of God in Jesus. That heart still exists today. There are some who also still look at Jesus with an apathetic heart. Maybe he was some sort of king. 
He's just not my king. I'm kind of indifferent toward him. He, he makes no difference in my life. He's not relative, uh, relevant to me in any way. And yet some look at him and say, he is a king, not just any king, he's my king. He's not just my savior, he's my king. I give him authority, not me. I place him in control, not me. I let him call the shots, not me. How do you see him today? Maybe some of us today have somewhat of a cynical heart or some of a, somewhat of an apathetic heart. And if that's you even today, what I want you to hear is there's no judgment here, but if you allow me to, I'd love to challenge you a little bit in this way. You know, sometimes when we find ourselves with a heart of cynicism or a heart of apathy, what we do is we try to keep God in arm's length. I read this week these powerful words that were written by a poet, a guy by the name of Anthony Gorilla. And what he says this, he says kind of with this idea of keeping God at an arm's length, he says, if you're close enough to wrestle with God, you're close enough to be embraced by him. It all depends how you see him. Will we see him as the source of our suffering or will we see him as the one who comforts us in it? Will we see him as the cause of our confusion or will we see him as the one who provides peace that passes all understanding? Will, he see, will we see him as the one who creates our pain or will we see him as the one who experienced it first? Will we see him as the one who wants to ruin our life or will we see him as the source of life itself? Will we try to make God in our image or are we willing to be broken and formed into his? The truth is this is that if we push him away and we're close enough to push him away, we're close enough to, for him to pull us in. If we're close enough to curse his name, we're close enough to be blessed by his name. If we're close enough to doubt his goodness, we're close enough to taste his goodness. If we're close enough to see his wounds, we're close enough to be healed by them. If you're close enough to push his hands away, you're close enough to see that those, those holes are there because of me. The truth is, the Good Friday is a reminder that God is not some distant God, that God came near in Jesus. That God is not just this antagonistic God against his creation, but God truly is the lover of our souls. This one. The one that they call Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. If you're close enough to wrestle with him, you're close enough to be embraced by him. So put down the fight and accept his embrace. This Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the one they called king. He's king of the Jews. He's king. He's king of your life. He is king. He is king of mine as well. So we surrender. We wrestle. And we worship. 
the King of all kings. Spoke your name in 
Let's see the 